Hi, welcome to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. My name is Scott Miller and I serve as your weekly host. Now each week we're privileged to have a different world-renowned thought leader with us in our studio, sometimes live, sometimes virtual, talking about their own leadership successes. In many cases they're business titans, authors, thought leaders, influencers that we have a chance to get a glimpse into their own leadership ideas. About once a month, I'm afforded the opportunity to share with you, kind of direct to camera, some of the leadership lessons that I've learned, in many cases from our guests, but also from our participants, our subscribers, our clients, people in Franklin Covey, and in some rare cases, my own career. And today I want to share two leadership lessons with you. The idea of bad news versus wrong news. Let's spend a few minutes defining both. First, bad news. It is a leader's job to accept bad news. That's why you're paid. In fact, as I look at most of how my time is spent, the majority of information coming to me is bad news. I'll bet it's five to 10% good news, meaning we won, Scott, we accomplished it. And about 10% is kind of neutral news, just reporting in. But I'll bet you about 70 to 80% is bad news. It's not going as planned. It's late. We didn't win the deal. We came in second place. The project's late or wrong, or there's a mistake. That's bad news. The client didn't sign the contract and we didn't win the deal. Now, bad news is acceptable, but it's the person's job who's delivering the news to deliver it as soon as possible to the leader. Now, it goes both ways, right? When there is bad news, you hope that the person is competent, empowered, and talented enough to solve it themselves. But as a leader, it's your job to help them solve it when appropriate. But if they don't bring you the news, it's often because you've not set the conditions. You've not set the culture where it's easy to bring you the bad news. Your temper, your personality, how you responded to the last time they brought you the bad news, right? It's your job to both set the conditions to make it easy to bring you bad news early, but not bring you bad news so often that they just throw in the towel, right? There's, a, there's kind of a fine balance there between making it acceptable to share bad news with you, but not so acceptable that people give up too soon. Now, the key is the timing. I'd argue that getting bad news sooner than later is so much more helpful to the leader because the leader's job is to help you solve it, fix it somehow. And if the leader can't, if you don't give the leader enough time, if you back them into a corner by telling them last minute, then the leader's options are you know, no longer broad, right? The, the, the number of days or hours or alternatives they have to quote kind of fill in the seams or place new bets are limited. As a sales leader, I would tell my team all the time, raise your hand early when you have bad news, tell me as soon as possible. I'll try to help work it out with you. If we can't work it out, that gives me then some more time to play some other bets to ensure that we both meet our team goal and deliver to my leader as expected. Bad news, leader's job is to accept it and the deliverer's job is to give it early on. Now the opposite, of course, of bad news isn't good news. I'd argue it's wrong news. Countless times I have people delivering me wrong news. Now wrong news is just flat out not acceptable. It means to me, you haven't done your job. You're not competent in this one area of your job because you've probably been guessing, making it up. I wouldn't go so far to say you've lied, but you've not gathered the facts. You probably haven't asked the tough questions or discussed the undiscussables or just taken it one step further with the vendor or the producer or the partner or the colleague to make sure you've gathered all the facts. So as a leader, you should never accept wrong news. In fact, I'll tell you just yesterday, I had a colleague who's otherwise very trustworthy and very competent. This person has a great career ahead of them, flat out delivered to me some bad news. But I called him on it and said, this isn't just bad news. This is wrong news because you should have been on top of this. You should have been setting all of the meetings, the conversations, setting the standard to make sure that you knew that it was going to be good news. I can accept bad news, but I will not tolerate wrong news. As leaders, I think it's incumbent upon you to make sure your team knows the difference between wrong news and bad news. Let's talk about friendships. Now this is a little less you know, focused on the professional. I think it's also a leadership lesson in our personal life as well. 
I happen to believe that way too many of us treat our friendships quite accidentally and less purposefully and intentionally. Think for a minute. Think about your top 5, 6, 10, 15 friends. Where do they sit in terms of how you selected them? Did you intentionally go out and befriend them because they met some need you had in your life? Or was it accidental? You sat by them at work, you worked out with them at the gym, you went to your, you know, your son or daughter's soccer team and you saw them five times and you had a beer together. I'm not saying that's wrong. In fact, sometimes some of our best friends perhaps started out accidentally. But I'd argue that the best friendships are very deliberate, very intentional. They fill a specific need that you have and you feel, fill a need for them that they are mutually reciprocal and beneficial, that you should actually seek out your friendships that serve a specific need for you. I read once an interview or, or heard an interview about satisfaction in marriage, and it talked about how unfair it is to think that your spouse can be your best friend in all of your needs. I mean, I married a very smart, wonderful woman. I'm madly in love with her, been married for 10 years, have three boys, and she can't meet all of my needs nor can I meet hers. She, I like to garden, she doesn't. I like to read, she does, doesn't have time. She likes to work out every day, I like to work out less. I like tennis, she likes running. I, I like champagne, she likes wine. We have a lot of differences, as are there are in most marriages. My wife can't be my best friend in all of my needs. Just like our friends can't be our best friends in all of our needs. You select friends for different purposes. I also think many of us have friendships we no longer benefit from. They're kind of hangers on, you know, they're, they're our, our project, or in worst cases, we're their projects. How many of us have friendships that we need to unwind intentionally, courageously, face to face even? You know what? We've been friends for a long time and it's been great and quite frankly, I think we're just kind of going in separate directions and I'm not sure it's working out for us anymore. Let's figure out, do we want to be friends? Do we want to spend time together? And if not, you know what? The world's a great place. We can find another friendship. Now, I know, easier said than done. But how many of us have tried to unwind a friendship by abandonment? And the other person calls you and texts you and emails you and wonders what happened, but you really lacked the courage to just break it off and unwind it. They probably won't like it, but I'll bet you'll feel more self-respect by actually ending it versus letting it kind of die a slow, comatose death. It's not good for either of you. Now, another friend principle I want to share is the concept of friending up, kind of like dating up. I think the step beyond intentional, deliberate friendships is thinking really carefully about what do your friendships do for you and what do you do for them? I have, for most of my adult life, always friended up. Older, wiser, better educated, more traveled, more culture, more successful, lessons learned. When my wife met me, who's 12 years my junior, she was about 27, I was about 39. Most of my friends were in their late 50s and 60s. And my wife couldn't figure out why are all of my fiance's friends my parents' age, meaning her parents' age. But the fact of the matter is, in my late teens and 20s, I really realized who I'm going to learn from are people who are vastly more successful than I am. And I've done just that. Now, some of you might think it's maniacal or even manipulative. I don't think so. I think it's just deliberate and intentional. The vast majority of my friends, in fact, almost all of them, are more successful for me than me because that's where I learn. And I'd argue the same for you. As you think about the future friendships, I don't think it's unreasonable to think, what can they do for me? As long as you are equally thinking, what can you do for them? The friends that I have that are above me in every level of life, they're wise enough to know what I need out of the friendship and they're getting something out of it as well. Because I constantly think, what can I do to make their life richer as well? It works both ways, but I challenge you to think about, are your friendships intentional, both professional and personal, and are you friending up? Hope those tips help you on your leadership journey. And we hope to see you here next week with a new guest in the On Leadership series. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Thanks for your time.